Hi, Book Club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 36, and our book is Bloodlines by Chris Raitt. This is the very first in the Warhammer crime series set in the hive city of Varangantua, and it follows Detective Augusto Zitteroff as he tries to track down a missing person. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Box channel. Spoiler warning. If you haven't yet read Bloodlines, go to the site, check out the book, check out the questions, and come back to this episode as we're going to be discussing this one from start to finish in great detail. With that... Let's dive in. As always, did you like the book? I really did like it. I enjoyed it. I did too. I really enjoyed it. I think I said that um, I really liked how he leaned into the grim noir, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the grim dark setting. And it really ended up reading kind of like an Agatha Ratesty. All right. So I've never never read any Agatha Christie novels. The only thing I know about him is that my mom read a couple and she was like, she hated them. And it was because she said Agatha Christie's problem is that there's always some random detail that they may or may not discuss in the book that is suddenly they bring up at the very end to be like, and that is how I knew who the murderer was. And I'm almost just like, what? So that kind of I actually off. really like Agatha Christie. My, my grandmother was a huge, that was her jam. And so I read a lot of them when I was a kid. And um, I really like them. And it just, and I think I mean it more in the, there was something, as soon as Udmil is kind of, her part is revealed, I was like, Agatha would be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> this overarching plot and ploy that she has. I, I just really liked it. I felt, I, you know, I liked the characters. I liked the plot. It was a nice, solid mm-hmm. mystery outing. So, what parts stood out to you? Um, well, probably the first one that stood out to me was when you find out exactly what Zido is doing with Lena. We're going to talk I all am... kinds of about that because, oh dear. Yeah, I, I was sad. I was like, man, I was cooler with you thinking that you were having an affair with her. So when he first walks in to her apartment and she wraps her arms around him, I was like, ugh, so disappointed. Even my husband was like, come on, man. And then at the end, when they reveal, we were both like, ugh, why couldn't you just be sleeping with her? (laughs) Exactly. I was telling Carrie earlier that when that gets revealed, my husband was literally sitting over here at the computer going, no, no. So funny story with that. Um, So when he's talking to Lena and he says, yeah, my wife thinks it's another woman and she snorts because remember there was that man he didn't know that greeted him. I was like, oh my God, is he having like that kind of an affair? Uh, I was like, well, that makes it even more interesting. And then... No, it's a cult. I'm like, why couldn't you just been having an affair? <laughs> Seriously, dude. And we're going to talk a lot about Man, that. Because woman, that's... I didn't care at that point. <laughs> I don't care what you're doing, dude. I'm not going to kink shame when it's that. Um, so one of the things I really liked a lot of the stuff they put in here about high of life. And this was on page 47. That's why I was like trying to flip and find it. Um, when he talks about how in the background he could hear music, the kind Naxi used to listen to. Lutya dances with lyrics about young love and civic duty. <laughs> that, do you remember that? Because it made me laugh. That cracked me up. And then there was another line when he's talking with Naxi's old friend. And she's like, oh, I'm just waiting for them to find me a husband. Like, you know, get me an appro- approved husband. And, uh. Yeah, the other line that I uh, same about that that I highlighted was on page 88 when they said um, a battered old Audex hammered out some old time slow beat standards, the kind of thing the municipal family planning departments pumped into Hayes Dens to get the official childbirth rates up. <laughs> like, look, I know that life in a hive is not glamorous. So they're just playing a lot of let's get it on by Marvin Gaye. <laughs> That's all 
I could think of are like Solomon Burke's Cry to Me. Like that's just all they play all day long. Or like, oh man, life at a hive is not easy. But good God, like no, no, I would no think way that... to send home the message. It's like, why are you guys encouraging babies? Don't you aren't you having a population issue as it is? Well, actually, it didn't sound like these guys are. I mean, outside of the normal stuff. But yeah, I mean, these people, they live brutal young lives. You got to have replacement workers. So, like, it. Look, I read a lot of the God's Ghost books and the Caiaphas Cain books. And, dude, this, if I think this sent home that you are just a wheel in the machine. Please keep the machine running. Sent it home even more than those. It's like, dude, there's just, there's no love. And even Zidorov wasn't getting extra love. Although I did like that he and his wife seemed to have a very happy marriage. Mm-hmm. By high as, standards. As much as you can. Right. When you work 20 hour days. Right. So let me ask you that. What did you think of Varen Gantua as a setting overall? Because this is new Hive World for this. Yeah, it is. But at the same time, it's almost like any other hive world it's dirty (laughs) you got strong criminal you know uh, underground going on that has her hands and everything and then of course you have i love that they call them the gilded you have you know the wealthy that are above everybody they're living separate and they're just kind of looking down on everyone and then they still have those really 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 high buildings not a, their habs don't seem to be as high as they are in other cities like Terra, for example other planets right. like Terra, for example but they still have those super super tall buildings for when they're bringing in cargo um but another note it's just like wow yeah you know um still wouldn't want to live in this if i got beamed into this oh, universe oh, i still wouldn't want to live here no, and when they talked about him driving out to Udmill's like country estate and how there's like real grass and real plants, like just the fact that he's marveling over that, I was like, this all sucks. What made me really <laughs> sad was when he went to that, um, I guess like condominium hotel to meet that the senior probator, and he was talking about how they mm-hmm. were watering with real water. I was like, oh, oh yes. Oh, is that a luxury? That's so sad. Oh, again, I know, I know, I I keep quoting, I think it's the beginning of the young adult series, life in the 41st millennium is hard. (laughs) Like, oh my god, and it does, it kind of makes you, and I think because we read as much as we do about the have-nots, that when he talked about, like, the pools of water for the plants, I was like, ugh, wasteful assholes. Oh, right, which I wouldn't think anything about until he made the comment that it was real water. I was like, oh my god. And we're using it for plants. It kind of reminded me a lot of, um, in Mass Effect, when you visit the Citadel and you get to the higher arches of the Citadel where the wealthy people are and they talk about how they have real water and real fish in these areas. And some people are like, we've never even seen fish before. It just made me disgusted. (laughs) Well, it's the same thing, right? Exactly, yeah. This grotesque, grotesque different divide. And yeah, when he talks about driving out to the country and like these wide open roads and when he's in the house and Udmill's like, "Um, I don't know if I've ever actually really been here. Oh my God. Like, it's just this great divide. And I did love that they called them gilded. Actually, along those lines, do you know one of my favorite features of this book is? Hmm. The glossary. Okay, so I didn't discover that till I finished reading the book. I discovered it accidentally because I literally went to drop the book. I butterfingered it and I grabbed it by the back and I was like, oh, oh, citrus flavored alcohol beverage. That's what Resi is. It's Zima. <laughs> it's grim dark Zima. I didn't think about it being Zima. I was actually thinking of like White Zen or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, when I was reading, it's like, well, you know, some of this stuff would have been useful, but some of this, you know, I already kind of figured out on my context, own. Context clues were pretty strong in here. Yeah, yeah. But I liked it. I got to the end and was like, that's really smart. Um, I guess just in case, like, you got to something and we're like, mm. 
Well, I, uh, know, there were some terms that we don't normally see in, you know, Space Marine Vets, because, like, except for, like you said, like, you know, drinking the resi, well, normally we see um, amaranth or... Uh, oh. Um, no, Emasek. Emasek. Gosh, I know I was not saying that right. Oh. But, um, but, yeah, so we see them drinking, you know, usually Emasek, or we'll see them, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, is it the this you know d- different different food different um just different phrases phrases for things so that so i mean like i said i you know i was able to figure it out from you were fr- from but context. i did like but i did just, like it okay well, i don't remember the other thing was was the uh the 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 cotton cotton whatever cotton the, yeah but what, what they were smoking because first what, what we see normally is the low sticks yes the fact and i i really liked the fact that they were smoking i was saying cotton because i just assumed it was supposed to be a playoff of oxycotton um, i was imagining crack because they're talking about the injectors and the pipes so yeah kind of something like that actually i kept um, saying content because of oxycontin so <laughs> in my head I right content right um it was yeah, and I think that was, and you kind of see this when you read the Necromunda books a little bit, but I feel like they really explored this here more, was that, as you said, like, usually in the other books we see, there's a low stick, and there's Amasek, and there's, you know, it makes it seem like there's this just, well, look, there's just one. There's just, <laughs> oh, I mean, we chose one type of uh, lethal, or um, illicit Narcotic. substance. Yeah, we chose one type of necrotic, and that's really all we have for the entire Imperium. So I really like that there was this variety here, and they really showed you that, yeah, we've got all kinds of shit we're putting into our body. Well, we live in a hive, and it's miserable. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if there was only one one variety. Right. To be honest. To be fair. Right. The way that they all have to share resources or their tithe, as they so kindly put it. I did like how well he set up, though, the idea that... So at first, when I when they said they were coming out with Varangantua, this new hive world for this crime, I was like, oh, so it's going to be like a reskinned Necromunda. And I really did like that they... There are gangs, but there's not like like the Escher gang, but now no, we call them the Resher gang. And this it's is a like little more turf more, warfare. More white color in a way too like just mafia kind of, like I more think, mafia. mafia i was mafia. about to say like organized, the mafia organized crime that's that's the word organized word. crime right more like the families not, not like there's a low color, level yes mm-hmm. i knew it you meant but like yeah like there's the low level thugs who run around and are kind of you know skirting on the streets but really it all trickles back up to these five families right well in this case it was really like the three families but I thought that was very interesting. Uh, I thought Von Jella's interaction with those families when they're like, look, she's got to walk the line between we get our money from these people. We can't piss them off. But there's also a line that they can't cross to. Right. I really liked that. I thought that was interesting. It made it made Von Jella as an authority figure. It made her likable. But to a point, right? Where right. she's not evil. No, she's just no, a product of the system. She's not evil, but at the same time, you can't help but be disgusted by it. It's like, you know, if he, you know, he had all this proof that this one family was doing all these bad things. And she's like, yeah, but we can't go after them because then how are we going to get funded? Which was exactly why he went underground with it. Yes. And didn't ask permission, asked forgiveness instead. But. But at the same time, the way it all ended up going down, you know, it wasn't that the probators took this guy down. It was natural causes. Right. And uh, so it all kind of worked out. But but now because he's because that the main guy is gone, she has to go find somebody else to kiss their ass to get funding. Right. Exactly. Once the head and, and I did like the point how she's like. Well, sure, you got head of the ja- you got rid of the Jax family head, but first off, is it now Udmil Tereshova? What the hell is that going to be like? Or Laxile, I guess now. But 
what's that going to be like now? Like, we don't know. Again, it's kind of that's potentially swapping the witch for the devil. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and you kind of felt, I mean, you understood her concern, even though you were kind of like, right? Like, right, uh, yeah. But I do understand what you're doing here. What did you make of Augusto as a detective? Do you think he was a good detective overall? Uh, so at the beginning, you know, he just kind of, he came across as your very stereotypical, just beaten down investigator who's just kind of going through the motions and he's pissed off he got this assignment that doesn't make any sense exactly at least with him though can we agree that at least with that like at first he's not one of those guys who oh, this case sucks no i mean no. He, he has a very real this doesn't make any sense. No, but what I was saying is that, you know, he comes off as this guy who's just kind of beaten down. He's just kind of going through oh, the yeah, motions yeah. and things. But then, you know, after that failed raid that he thought was going to be the answer to everything. And he took his friend's advice and did the legwork. I was like, okay, so now we see he really is a really good and crafty investigator. Yes. And once he really started, and I liked that. I liked the idea that he was kind of like, and I did like that from the get go. He's like, none of this makes sense. I, I sh why the hell did they grab me for this? This is dumb. This, there's something else here. And then, yeah, once he, and I, first off, can I just say how much I really liked that his friend did not turn out to be working for the bad guys or some other overly convoluted betrayal plot in there? No, oh, he was just another beat cop or a beat detective right. who was like, no, do so the work, that was all dude. very nice. Like, it got to a point. Because, um, so Jen texted me, it was like page 249, it just said, oh my god. So I get to this page, and he's going to visit Lena, and right then I was like, oh my god, she's the mole. And that sucks, because I was already kind of thinking she had something to do with this anyway, and I was going to be so disappointed, but then you find out something else, I'm like, oh, no. Uh, not even close. I loved that it was none of the usual suspects i did too and i had the same fear actually when she went because as soon as he told his buddy all of that my husband even said he's like and his buddy's gonna go straight to the bad guys with all this information and then when he went to see her before we read the scene i was like no right when the guy comes out when they talk about the other guy come out i was like yep there you go right here the betrayal is going to be revealed no, I, it, I, I should. It I should have, have trusted. Of, I should have trusted Rate. I almost believed it was Borodina, as well. Yes, yes. I thought she was going to end up being some sort of weird red herring, and nope, nope. I mean, I have to say, you know, overall this book, I'm, I just bravo because I didn't guess anything, and I like that. I ha it's so rare, and Chris Rate is so good at that. I mean, we say that that we you know, so rare for us to, you know, not be right with stuff. But at the same time, mm -hmm. every time we have said it, it's been with the Chris Rate novel, like the Watchers of the Throne books, um, Faults of Terror books. And now this one, like, I'm just going to try to s stop trying to figure him out because he's really, really good at dangling things. He doesn't, he, he doesn't, that's the other thing is he doesn't even dangle a red herring. That's what's so right. amazing about it. No, he doesn't. Well, I mean, he kind of... I don't know that he da doesn't dangle red herrings, but he definitely kind of skirts the trope, right? Where he definitely knows where the tropes are. And I feel as like it's almost like this book especially, I feel like it was him like driving in a car, kind of looking out and being like, on your left, you'll see trope number one. So, like, he doesn't ever lean into them to the point where they feel really lame. Like, if had his best friend turned out to be somebody, I would have been like, oh, come on, dude. But it's like, he definitely is aware they're a thing. And then he just keeps on going by. Well, Doesn't right. stop at that station. But it was more like it got to the point where I realized that he wasn't creating these red herrings. I was in my own mind because I was trying to figure, you know, I was trying to guess. I was trying to predict it. Mm hmm Yes. I same thing. I absolutely it was definitely me doing the jump to conclusions, Matt. Um, like hardcore. And I just once he started to do it, I felt it actually it is one of those things that when they got to the end 
and they reveal what's going on. I had the moment where when he's doing the history about her, why would she not want to keep her name? That is super weird. And he discovers Ian. Because the whole time I was reading this, I thought the first chapter was kind of like cell draining is bad, okay? That's what I thought. <laughs> Which, to be fair, cell draining is bad, okay? Okay, that was awful. That was so terrible. Just awful. And uh, it was so bad. And so I kind of the whole time I was like, oh, okay, so this is just, you know, like just to kind of demonstrate how bad this is. Um, and when he finds out, I am, you're just like, oh, oh, no. Also, I like that he mended the fence with Draj as much as you could. Right. I even kind of liked that guy. I did Not too. I mean, he was, look, what you see is what you get with him. He, there's... There was no... Oh, absolutely. No guessing. I mean, I, told, I was telling Sean about him. I was like, he's basically your stereotypical SWAT guy. Like, he just... Mm -hmm. Go break that. I <laughs> mean, that's, that's really all you want. He's the one driving the SWAT tank and, you know, opening up the doors, going, go, 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 and everyone getting out and thinking of, uh, like, South Park with the... Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> the SWAT guys are running through stuff. Um, was, rah, rah, exactly like that. Yeah. Exactly like that. Like, that's just kind of how I pictured him but I mean, talk about a guy who knows right from wrong 100% and all he wanted to do was just go burn the place Very down so. and I loved it when he just when he uh, got had that meeting with the off worlder and he was just like yeah I don't I don't deal with threats like that so he just calls Josh and was like want to go burn some things <laughs> you know, just... I loved that mm-hmm I thought that was, and I, I liked him too. Like you expect him to be again, the stereotypical loose kid and asshole, right? Who just like takes the law into his own hands or is just a jerk just to be a jerk. Nope. Um, nope. Just had a very, very clear sense of right and wrong. And I did like when he basically calls out Zitterov as being unfaithful and I'm going to the emperor's side. Are you? Mm -hmm. Dude. Well, because I talk like, about a guy who who knows what he wants. Like, he knows, not only does he know what he wants, but he's happy with who he is and what he does. Which is actually a very rare thing you can say about anyone li living a, on, a, on a hive world. Like, it really broke my absolutely. heart. Absolutely. It broke my heart when Zaido was talking to um, a friend of his daughter's when he's trying to find where, where she has gone. Because, of course, now we're thinking the worst. And I thought that was going to happen, too, that she was going to be found cell draining. I'm really glad that Chris Rate did not steer into that one. That was great. Yes. Because that would have cheapened, I think, a lot of it. I think it really would have. But when he's talking to her friend and she's telling him that they were all cheering for her that she got to leave and that you know they hope that she gets to go to the guard and he was just like yeah but do you have a life here and she's like oh what a life like here I am working at this place you know 18 hours a day till I can you know find a husband and put out kids and still be working here there's like nothing else nothing else where I can go and he's like but you're safe here and she's like am I you know am I and it just kind of made me very sad that the choices are living like that or going off to the guard and most likely getting killed before your 30th birthday you know what I thought was very interesting this book was one of the first books we've read in Warhammer 40k that deals with what I would call a middle class family yeah, it's true. Typically, you see the very, very, very top, or you see the very, very, very low, or you see like Adeptus Astartes or Sisters of Silence or people who don't really fall within the class system. No, no, no. Because I mean, like, really, uh, the only other uh, books that we read that don't have, that aren't focused on the Astartes, like we'll say the Inquisitor novels. Okay, so, but the Inquisitors, they kind of fall in that upper echelon. And the people they typically deal with are the lowest of the low, the homeless, the drug addicts. We don't, yes. so they either deal with that or they deal with people on top. It's really not much. The gilded. Yes, the gilded. They don't deal very much with the average worker. 
Well, and what I thought was very interesting about the fact that we get to see this middle class family is that they're wealthy and they're they're wealthy enough that my kid doesn't have to go off into the guard and I can recognize that the guard is not a good lifestyle but they're poor enough that they can't just buy their way out of it. Right. So this interesting thing that, and I did like the idea that she's like, I want to get off this planet. I want to go and do this thing. It's my duty. And she has bought into this hook, line, and sinker. And the parents, again, they're middle-class enough to be like, just become an Arbutus or something. Right. But she doesn't want to stay. That's, that's the big thing is that she doesn't want to stay on, on this planet and you know one thing i learned from reading the magos is that it's apparently very hard to leave a planet it apparently costs a crap ton of money to be able to leave a planet a lot of money Um, and you got to have connections right and like i it's just not it's not like just getting on an airplane and going uh which is kind of crazy i think but right it's but again i think that's part of that control at the same time that they try to have on these people. So like, cause I guess if you could just leave, how many people would just leave agri worlds? Right. Like who's going to stay there. And as she said, work at a textile meal mill for 18 hours a day, making army, making Imperial guard belts and whatever. Mm-hmm. Like who's going to choose that if you didn't have, well, I mean, anyways, <laughs> it was just very interesting to see this dichotomy of this is a, firmly middle class family which is something we really don't get to see very often and their no but the world view the world view is so different but it doesn't suck any less because this is what they are faced with it's like they right. have they have a choice yes they have a choice unlike most of the others cuz like if you think about it even the super wealthy don't really have a choice like their choice is to stay where they are mm-hmm. um, but so they have a choice to join the Imperial Guard and get off world or take a menial job like everybody else and fit in that part of the Imperium machine. Well, and it's interesting that she's... I would not want to live this. (laughs) No! God! God, no! Are you crazy? No! And the sad thing is, like, I was, like, thinking, like, you know, why, where, like, what job could I possibly have? If I lived in this. Oh, right. Okay. Well, okay. And I think dream dream job or probably realistic job. Realistic. Just like with my skill set, the way it is right now. Oh. Moving into 40K. So I'm like, you and I would probably be like, I'd be an archivist or a scribe somewhere. And that sounds awful just because of, yeah, it's backbreaking work it's not this fun idea of look at all this knowledge and archiving it it's awful <laughs> it's just awful can you imagine <laughs> no. no it would be terrible because again you're just like strapped to this for 18 hours you probably have some sort of augmentics that make you really good at your job mm-hmm. and it's just no because like there's not even a like a thing that I could think of that I would be like, oh, well, this would be super fun. Like, I'd be on an Inquisitor ship. No, that sounds pretty awful, too, for being honest. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where would be a good option because I wouldn't want to work with the navigators because even though, yes, I have this really cushy place to live in, I'm still with navigators who declare war on one another for petty reasons. And oh, and guess what? You're the bargaining chips. You're the, I need to send a message. So, oh, by the way, that archivist you liked, killed. He got devoured. <laughs> <laughs> they got devoured as part of our clan war. Right. Right. I, I, working with an inquisitor. No. <laughs> oh, God, no. Right. No. Because once you start with an inquisitor, there's no retirement. There's no finding another job. Uh, no. You're there no, for No, you basically do it till you die or get killed. Or get arrested. So, let's compare that then with Udmil Tereshova. What did, for first off, what did you think of her as a character? Like, her whole arc and presentation. Uh, I didn't think much of her at first, but I think that's, that was the point. Right. Um, it's really not until you learn more about her 
and what her ultimate plan is because she comes off initially actually I'd say through about two-thirds of the book as someone who is you know, she married out of convenience because she uh-huh. needed money she didn't want to lose everything that she had and um yeah, he had another son, so okay, good. She didn't want to have kids with him anyway. And just, you know, yeah, you know, it's, he's the heir and whatever. I have my own businesses and this kind of goes on. And I'm not happy here and I do hate my son. I do hate the son. And and you assume it's because he's not hers. You know, it just it's just kind of what you assume. Especially after he talks to the sister. Um that she doesn't care about him and she's she's found someone she really loves instead and is going to leave her husband for love and possibly more money and then she can you know just kind of start her own life and it's really how everything seems to go until you learn no it so speaking of another trope yeah as i say she had good reasons not to like her son she had even better reasons not to like her husband i mean i wanted to choke her husband when zaito confronted him about the cell draining he's like do you even know what that process is he's like it's just business at first i did love how it's a, it's an unta- it's a unsavory business distasteful and he's like yeah that's what everyone says and then when mordock kind of finally leans into the fact that eh, it's just business what are you gonna do which at first, when they started with the cell draining, I was like, okay, that seems a little weird and maybe a little too over the top. But then once they start explaining, yeah, look, the shipping lanes are down. We can't get stuff in here and we've got su- we've got supply, we've got demand and no supply. Then all of a sudden I was like, oh, oh, that would be so problematic. And especially in this universe where people don't really like... There's not like an APB that goes out. B2 dubs, Kadia has fallen, Astronomicon's right. out, Warp Rift, it's going to be a little messy for a while. You just get rumors and stuff. And so I thought that was really interesting. But at first, speaking of another trope that he didn't lean into, I was really worried that she was going to be like the bored, scorned, scorned woman. That she's like, well, you know, I got rich off of Tereshova, but now I'm going over to this Jack guy because... <laughs> reasons i just decided i was angry and wanted to ruin him or even worse some type of petty i just want all the power and money right nope she definitely set out with a much more she was a gilded super super privileged person and yet kind of had morals right and i don't want to say heroic is not the right word but kind of the savior that that city needed for that particular thing and you get the impression that look there's still going to be cell draining let's be real not under her watch though right which that's pretty cool yeah i thought i really liked that were you surprised that she didn't know that he was also involved in cell training. No, it didn't surprise me because uh, it would just. Why would he let her in on that? You know, he's getting everything that he wants. He's taking down the competition. He's taking down, you know, a rival cartel at the same time because they're pinning all the blame on this rival cartel. Right. And he's getting more money from her. I mean, so he's doing it too. I mean, all he knows, but at the same time, though, how much did she really tell him that that, 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 that's why she's going up against him is because of the cell draining. She may never have told him or she might have told him and he's just like, oh, I'll take care of you. Oh, right. No, I got you. I got you, fam. Mm -hmm. You're right. That's cell draining. Unsavory business. (laughs) Like... Right? And you felt really kind of bad for her there that she kind of backed the wrong horse. But did she really? I mean, I'm not saying that she did not come out any worse in the end there. Um, no, I think she came out better. Probably, yeah. So, so in terms of a mystery, from start to finish, do you think this book did... So, 
we have this conversation. This is one of those things. I think we got asked in one of our Patreon episodes, and I wrote a whole thing of article about this where it's like the line, the Warhammer horror line sometimes struggles between, well, this just feels like Warhammer 40k. Mm-hmm. Do you think, how does this compare compared to, like, say, Watchers of the Throne or Chris Rate's other, his non crime writing? Um, I believe it. I strongly believe that it stands on its own. And that's because it's so easy to look at, you know, some of the, the crime novels. Like, okay, well, let, let's look at Watchers of the Throne and Vaults of Terror. Those crime novels, those are crime novels, but they have, and, they have, and there are mysteries, but they impact the overall lore. This does not. This is just another day in the life of not an inquisitor, not a custodian. Not in debt to Sestartes. Regular guy. And they are babies. And more importantly, you know what I really liked about this book? So when we first saw, and I talk about this a lot, with the superhero movies, once you get to a certain level for stakes, it doesn't like it kind of loses some of its impact honestly when you're fighting to save the world this was just like he just took down yeah he took down kind of one of the major heads of that family that family's still fine um he took out cell draining uh, mostly. for now under oh yeah mostly like he did this major thing and yet you get the impression that it's like excellent that's like scratching the surface yeah <laughs> he i mean big big move but really it almost makes him more of like your friendly neighborhood zitterov he just took down this one minor thing that i mean off obviously awful but i do and i think i like that from the mystery i don't know that like mechanically in terms of mysteries we've always said that chris Wright does a really good mystery I don't know that it necessarily, like, I didn't read this and I was like, ooh, this is even more mysterious than Watchers of the Throne. No, it, it's probably on par with, but because it's at, like such a micro level, mm-hmm. and it does, there's something more human about it because it doesn't have a, a soulless person and all these giant superhumans running around, right? Like, it's this guy, if this guy gets shot, he's in big trouble right like, yeah. it's not like a space marine where if he gets shot he's gonna be like no nah, he'll heal <laughs> shrugs it off right exactly <laughs> literally like, walks like every injury off <laughs> right like there is i really i mean i think if you listen to this podcast at all you know how much i loved watchers of the throne but there is kind of this like oh you're like demigods right this was just this is just like people and i liked that and it was it's very unique for us especially i feel like yeah it, you know and these it's probably like you know necromunda as well it just kind of shows like these slices of life just one of the millions of hive worlds in the imperium showing being one of untold billions how you live your life Yes. And generally, did. you know, for me personally, like, I look at the Space Marines more because this is my, you know, it's just not my life. But, you know, it's sometimes you don't want to read about the little people because mm-hmm. you're already living the little people life. So sometimes yeah. you, really, you like the superhero stuff. You like the Space Marines. You like Absolutely. the larger than life. But every now and then it's so nice to see, like, and meanwhile, the other side of the Empire this shit goes on in everyday life like talk about a bunch of people who have never seen a space marine like oh my gosh and they were even questioning whether it wasn't an inquisitor they were questioning whether something even existed which made me giggle gene stealers gene stealers that's what it was they were like that's just a story come on you know um i mean they know that there's xenos out there but you know they're not thinking about gene stealers or the nids or anything like that they're just... uh, by the way, that was one of my favorite lines when they were talking about the off-worlder and she was like, Ugh, I'd rather trust the Xenos. <laughs> I was like, 
<laughs> oh my god. Y- yeah, yeah. You know, just uh, yeah. <laughs> but you just kind well, of and it does. At- it reminds you how ignorant especially because again we read so many things with space marines and not just like watchers of the throne we've read um well we're about to read um another book with robbie bobby and we read so much stuff with him and we read stuff with the adeptus sororitas and people who you would say are in the know like these people who are just like yeah the shipping lanes are borked why reasons wasn't there a rumor that the astronomicon went out i don't know Astropaths went crazy. Uh. Yeah, like I, I, all of the I snickered at that with the astropaths, and I said they all went crazy, and that some of them still aren't working right. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Ooh. I'm curious of which side of the rift you guys are on. <laughs> I am curious as well, because either side you're going to have problems. Re- yes, yes, you are. I'm just curious. I am as well. But I did like that idea that it there's something kind of refreshing. I think and also what you said, where it's not this big lore impacting thing. Mm-hmm. This does not end with a call to Robbie Bobby. <laughs> no, this is Can not going imagine? to his voicemail. <laughs> Could you imagine if you tried to call and was like, Robbie Bobby, there's cell draining going on here? He'd be like, I don't care who gave you this number. <laughs> like, like and that, that oh my would, God. he would really be like and you're not taking care of this. Why? Pretty much. Like, I got... <laughs> I've got I got Dark Angels trying to kill the Primaris Marines. I got Gene Stealers hiding in Space Marines. I got an AI in my ship. I got Nids. Fucking Everywhere. Nids with the Eurotrash Space Vampires. <laughs> I gotta repopulate the Eurotrash Space Vampires. Yeah, they're... <laughs> Is Kena there. is broken. <laughs> oh, and the Necrons have basically claimed the entirety of Imperial Nihilus. Please tell me more about low hive trash getting their blood sucked out. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, it's like when you put it like that. <laughs> like a simple no, I can't help you would have been fine. <laughs> I felt so bad for him. Actually, I don't think a lot of the characters that we've read about would really give a shit about this. Even the Inquisition would be like, call me back when there's a demon. Like, is there a demon? Are you using are there, Xenos? Are, gene stealers? are you using Xenos technology? No? I don't care. <laughs> Asterisk next to that particular point. But, so let me ask you this. Was the end satisfying to you? It was. It was, and I, I really liked it, and I liked how, you know, that they didn't clear up this whole cult business, because that just lays down nice little fodder for next book. But it's not, but even with that, it's not one of those that feels like, you didn't answer all these questions. No, I don't need them answered right now. Oh, no, you can feel, because, and I know that on the book it says, Anagosto Zitterab novel, which that phrasing implies there's going to be more of these which i'm very glad for at least one um but i got the impression with some of the stuff that i still had questions about it was very clear that this will be in another book like he's he's just he was just setting up he was world building here a lot of that was just general Varangantua world building, world building for his character, setting the stage, kind of just throwing little ideas out there that he can always come back to this well. And there was so much in there too that I feel like a sequel, pretty much anything you would be like, oh, write that. Mm -hmm. I was a little surprised when she shoots him and then basically... (laughs) They're like, oh, okay, and uh, she killed that one dude, and everything's just kind of going back to normal. Now it really sucks, because we're going to have to find a new uh, patron, basically, but uh, good job. (laughs) I was kind of like, oh. Well, she died of a heart. He died of a heart attack. That's true. (laughs) I did like that. Like, he died of a heart attack. Hmm. Weird. I, and I actually did like the little um, message 
that Edmil left for him. She's basically like, actually. yes, like this is all that happened. You were 100% correct, but you weren't correct about this, but I'm going to explain this to you. Right. And I did take care of this problem. <laughs> like you just basically confessed to murder, but you know, but then again, the thing melts, you know, and she leaves nice. Like, and if you tell anybody any of this or that I talked to you or you tried to reach me at any time, I will make sure you are killed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We understand well, one another. And she established early on in the book, too. She established that I know where you live. I know oh, what yeah. your family life is like. Keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. So I liked that. I thought that was kind of interesting. Let us address the giant ass serpent in the room. Oh, my God. I fucking can't. Okay. So, first off, first off, the uh, Genesis. Uh, reference there you're talking about you know it's like oh god you know basically saying god is in many forms like the snake I'm like oh you mean like Satan who was the snake and tempted Eve yeah okay any I get it time that the phrase well god comes in many forms is used yeah, yeah. it's a cult just so we're clear yeah. and especially if you were worshipping a giant serpent! I mean, well, first of all, <laughs> when is ev- when is a serpent a sign of anything good? Let- let's be honest here. I mean, and even, like, if you think about, like, if you can picture, like, the medical, the doctor's logo with the medical cross yeah. with the snake around it, the snake serves a very, iconography-wise, it serves a very specific purpose, and it's not happy, happy. No. Nope. Um, so, yeah, uh, I hate to, I hate to say it, but sorry, Snicks, I know you're not all bad, Snicks. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the nope ropes are just not a thing that you want to worship. And look, something's zinchy here and you're not going to convince me otherwise. Maybe Chris Wright would convince me otherwise, but something is zinchy. Oh, it's very zinchy. You're worshiping a snake. A giant serpent that, no, it's totally... God, like, everybody worships the emperor in different forms. Okay, no, they don't. I mean, yeah, but, like... No. <laughs> like, how there's different representations of Santa Claus, but they're all kind of the same, okay. right? Okay, yeah. Like, because like, I think there was... um, There's a book... I think it was Dan Abnett, but they talk about going to this agri world, and they worship... It's kind of funny now, especially as, as much as we've been reading about Mortarian, but they worship the emperor as like this giant harvest god, and he has this giant scythe, and he is there to. But you're still worshiping the emperor, not a fucking snake. Right. I. Like, I literally had to set the book down, and my husband and I both were going, No! Why could you have been having an affair? Why couldn't you just fuck her like a normal person would? (laughs) Why are you worshipping a snake? And the fact... Okay. God, there's so much to unpack here. Let's talk about the scar. The scar that twitches. And he doesn't remember how he got it. He doesn't remember how he got it. The sad thing is... And oddly enough, it seemed to twitch quite a bit when he was... Agitated, yeah. Uh, so one thing that that reminded me a lot of was um, Shroud of Night. When, you know what I'm talking about, when the lead guy, he, I know what you're about. he uh, dies and then a Zinchi demon is just like, oh, but I can, you know, but you want to live. He's I like, can pop you back. And he's like, but not with you, but... But he talks him into it and that he doesn't remember how he came back, but he has this awful scar. Yeah, I have a feeling some weird things went on at that cult. Like the first some meeting. shit's going down. And if you go back, like I went back, I just did like a quick flip through. Some of the spots at which his scar starts bothering him are interesting. And it's I just feel like it's culty. And part of me is like with um, with the whole... Do you remember when he goes to 
spy on that cell draining thing in the beginning when mm-hmm. and then they pack up and they leave. Part of me is like, how do you know that the cult's not watching everything you do through your little scary scary boy? See, I, I didn't really think any I didn't think very much about the scar until he was in the hospital and that Medicaid's like I, I've never seen anything like that. So you're going to have to tell me how you got it. He's like, I really don't know. It's like, huh. I know. Well, because after that, you already know but, that he's worshipping the salvia thing that you're like. Right. So, I mean, it kind oh of, like, by itself, I'm like, eh, okay, it's kind of weird. But, you know, sometimes you just have these scars that that react to things. You know, it's like, you know, having a bad knee it reacts to the weather. I don't think anything of it. But then you add it to the cult. Yeah. And it's just so sad because these cults, all not all of them, but I think most of them start out the same, that they truly believe they are worshipping the emperor, which just makes it even sadder in the end. Well, I think some of them do. Some of them know what they're doing. He, though, clearly does not. No. And it just broke my heart when he talks about how he feels alive. And it's the only time he feels alive is when, praise the serpent, the serpent rises. And you're just like, why can't you get a drug habit like other normal people to feel high? <laughs> like, seriously, or, no chaos. Or if what you're missing is faith and religion, it sounds like there's a church on every corner. Oh, uh oh. Your sound died. And it was really funny when he goes and he talks to the ecclesiarchy girl, and he's like, oh, I've always hated priests. Apparently not all priests. Oh, but they're all equals. Wearing masks. Because there's... Okay, and by the way, what religion that involves masks ever ends well? Uh, None that I've seen in any books, video games, or movies. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. If you have to hide who you are to be part of something, that's not good typically a bad sign also and more importantly if you need to don a special robe and a mask historically not good things generally yes stepping out on a limb here but so then oh my god all of him worshiping this which is interesting super interesting because this might be the first I'm trying to do a quick catalog in my head here. Might be the first book we've read in which a character is maybe potentially unbeknownst to them totally worshipping chaos. That's kind of interesting. What do you think happened with his daughter in the end with it? I read that a couple of times. And I'm not exactly sure because, you know, when she said, when she yells at her dad that you don't believe, that could, you know, now knowing about the cult and then you hear about that guy that was, that was there, you know, at the, um, he was talking about the serpent and Brooke was like, it was just weird. Like, I think he's like one of the Ordo or something, just the way he was talking about it. But next, he never really kind of brought up the whole thing. So it's like, right. well, um, it could mean either way. It really could. Um, especially since she's been in a scolum this whole time with the Imperial Guard. I have a mm-hmm. very hard time believing that she has worshipped, that she is worshipping, not worshipping the Emperor, like the throne and, and all that. Um, but with this guy there, like, I, I don't know. Maybe, I think she maybe fell into a wrong group. I think running away... She went to see some old friends, and some old friends, of course, are like, hey, have you heard about Salvia? You know, another form of the emperor? She's like, well, no. Well, and remember, so here's how, here's what makes her particularly interesting. She wants, because she's been at the Skullum, she wants to go serve the emperor. She has all this faith and all this passion. And for somebody who had maybe less than pure intentions... That's, like, the easiest person to go after, Especially right? Especially when she's all mad at her parents. Well, we understand you. Hey, kids, mad at your parents? 
love the emperor think your parents don't love the emperor as much as you do we got something for you so here's when he talks about when um brecht talks about the guy Mm -hmm. and he says um he worried me a bit, intense, religious. He seemed to be dominating them a bit, and I didn't like the way he didn't blink. He had a slate, too. It was him that owned the place. And now, when he talks about how he looks like he could have shot me without a thought if he wanted to, and Zidoroff was like, oh, man, is that the Ordos? All I could think about was that guy from the beginning of um, the last... The John it? French Inquisitor novel we Incarnation? read. Incarnation? Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Incarnation. When they talked about that guy in the beginning, the unblinking guy who goes down there and starts preaching all this chaos stuff. Man, I got chills when he described that. Full body chills. Because they, uh, and that's all I could think of. So I was like, dude, this is totally, like, plus your heart. Because, but. I was going to say, bless your heart that you think it's totally on the level in an Inquisitor. Although, I mean, let's be real. Mm-hmm. It could go either way and I would not be surprised. Oh, yeah. Because it could be, 100% could be, an Inquisitor who's trying to root out this cult. And what better way to root out a cult than pretend that you're part of one and recruit people? Because... Idiots, I swear to God. They create their own heretics half the time. uh, I feel as though a really good lawyer could have a field day with entrapment laws. Oh my God. Um, Oh my God. But on the other hand, like, is this one of those things where this might be one of those things where I'm like, yeah, you kind of want to see how deep this goes. Mm -hmm. And the answer is pretty deep because one of your head detectives is totally into this. As well as a few other key members of the police force. That was one of those things where I was just like, oh my god. So I cannot, I cannot wait for another book to see what happens with that. And the fact that you have, and that, but also, the Salvia thing is broad enough that any other writer in the Warhammer crime line could pick that up. Mm -hmm. They could absolutely be like, oh, by the way, Salvia cult. Well, it's super enough. exciting and it's i mean well, the first key is when they're like you know this is something that they worship before the emperor got here and when the emperor got here they realized they were one and the same yeah um generally when you worship something before the emperor showed up it's one of the chaos gods that's just generally how you it just goes. think it's Cadia, right from the first heretic oh god i first of all I don't know, this is not a 30k podcast, but when you realize that they're on Cadia, which is, I mean, it's kind of obvious because they're talking about how close they are to, you know, the edge of the warp storms, like that's got to be the eye, and, you know, the, the fact Cadia, that they all have purple eyes. Right, and then they mentioned the purple eyes, it's like, motherfucker, they're on Cadia, and Cadia used to be a land of chaos worshippers. Did not see that coming. No, I don't think, I don't think anybody did. I mean, it makes sense. Oh, totally. That close to the eye, but yeah. Oh, absolutely. But yeah, it's one of those things that when you find out, you're like, oh, geez. But that totally made me think of that, too. Like, oh, this is just the form of the emperor we worship before the emperor got here. So then you weren't worshiping the emperor, just so we're clear. Right. No, no, we were worshiping this other dude who's chained to his golden chair, obviously. It just happens to be in a snake form. Well, and like spire. Like the Mechanicus and, and the Omnissiah. They've always worshipped the Omnissiah. So when the Emperor came, like, this must be the Omnissiah. Well, he never once said he was the Omnissiah. He's just, you know, That's true. Yeah, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm the Emperor. And they can, and they still worship the Omnissiah. And I think the Emperor almost tolerated it because they believed he was the Omnissiah. But at the same time, if you worshipped him before he arrived, you had no idea about who this guy was. Is he really the Omnissiah? Or is it something else? Like a Void Dragon? Well, to be fair, he did put the Void Dragon there. So, he, I'm going to give him this one. But, oh. He did. What, right? if it's ju- what if it's just a giant Catan shard under the planet and that's what they're worshipping? 
I will laugh really hard. But so I really as much as I really enjoyed this kind of little diversion that we had and we got to learn about this new planet and this new world and this new line. And that's really exciting. I am really, really excited to get into this guy next. So pretty. Also, can we talk about how this is like one of the nicest special editions the Black Library's ever? I feel like I say that Aside a lot. Aside from the Siege of Terra books. Yes. Look at this etching oh, yeah. in here. Oh my god. And the artwork inside is lovely and guys, there's a map. Ooh, I like maps. I love maps. And we I will don't get do maps you... very often. <laughs> yeah, and I will also do you a favor and not sing the It's the Map song. But if you have kids, you already know what I'm talking about. And can we talk about, like, stuff like that is just, oh, so, God. Okay, I didn't realize this, but it looks like there's some uh, short stories. Yes. Surrounding this. Cool. There's cool. some cool stuff in here that I'm really, really excited about. And, um, oh my god, there's an entire appendix about, like, notes that you need to know about. Oh my god. Well, I'm, you know. this is, a, I'm so excited to get back to Robbie Bobby, and even though, <laughs> Robbie Bobby. technically we're going really, really back to Robbie Bobby, because this is, like, right after he woke up, but I'm super jazzed. Well, you know, what's the so fun excited. if we keep, you know, staying the course the whole time, right? I mean... It's got to go back and forth through time. That's just kind of how this all rolls, right? The last Dark Imperium book ended on a bit of a cliffhanger. Anyways. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for this one. Yeah, Do you want to well, take us out, Gary? we got to fill in those 100 years, though, before Dark Imperium. I don't Do know why. We? I don't know Do why. We? But uh, well, we got you know a pretty what? book out of it. And if Guy Haley is going to lead the charge... I'm down. That is true, because at least he knows where he's going with the with the Dark Imperium. For sure. So, in Gi, we trust. We do trust in Gi. You want to take us out, Carrie? Yeah, I will. So, thank you guys so much. You've listened to the Warhammer 40k Book Club episode regarding Bloodlines by Chris Raitt. So be sure to join us for our next book, Dawn of Fire, Avenging Sun, by the one and only Gi Haley. We are an official book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those good things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Don't forget, we also have a Patreon where we offer two different tiers of content for your viewing and listening pleasure. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash wh40k book club. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. Good night, everybody. Good night.